Uh, hi all and welcome to the next session of the CRC Time Forum. Uh, my name is Jason Kirby. Um, hopefully you've seen me, my face around a few times now. I'm the program leader of the Data Integration Forecasting and Scale program within CRC Time. And I hope you are doing well wherever you are in Australia in these challenging times that we actually are dealing with at the moment. Uh, I apologize right from the start. You will see my head bobbing up and down as I'm reading. So you'll have to, sorry about that as, as we're working through of my notes that I'm looking at at the moment. Uh, to start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians across the lands on which we live and work across Australia and pay our respects to the elders, part, both past and present. I would especially like to acknowledge the Karuna people, uh, the traditional owners of the lands I am sitting on and working on in South Australia and the Wadadjuri people of the traditional, traditional custodians of the lands where I was born and also raised and grew up and interacted when I was in uh, Central West New South Wales. Um, right from the start, do a bit of uh, housekeeping. Uh, as said multiple times as we're working through the session here, there is an option for you to ask live Q&A or live, live questions as we're going along. And as we have the time with different presenters, we will try to address those as we're going. Uh, we do not have a lot of time, so there is also the opportunities we're going into uh, into the different session or towards the sessions to answer those in the in the forum or in other areas as we as we move out of the session, of course. Um, so in the Q and A is what I'm getting at is where you can ask questions of the different presenters. Uh, but there is a reminder that the forum is for general comments and to interact with other other attendees, not for the Q and A session that we're in at the moment. The agenda of this session um, will start with a, a presentation or a keynote presentation by Dr. Karina Kemp on the power of data platforms. Um, and it'll be followed by, if we've got a bit of time, a couple of questions to Karina moving forward. Um, followed that, there will be three presentations on foundational projects from findings around data and platforms that have been occurring over the last six to 12 months. And then after this session, I hope you'll be have time to actually sit in the workshops that are really strategic areas for the program moving forward. And that's around cumulative regional impact assessments uh, chaired by Renee Young at Wobsey and also innovation and demonstration um, uh, of tr and trial sites that is being led or chaired by Greg Davis and Elise Belke from CSIRO and Pete Borders from BHP. Um, but to move forward, I would like now to introduce Dr. Karina Kemp, who is currently an independent advisor on all things data to help organizations on their digital uh, transformation journey to innovation and to get the most out of their data. Karina has 20 years experience working for organizers, organizations such as Geosciences Australia and also with the Australian Ac Academic and Research Network, ARNET, in providing scientific and digital leadership to enable data science solution and digital transformation strategies. Uh, one of the benefits of being in this position in CRC time is, is being able to connect with people such as Karina, who have a passion for all things about data and how it can be used in innovation and to address real world challenges, which is what the CRC is really about. So without ado, I would like now to pass on to, uh, well, we'll give the stage to Karina and her presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. and um, And and thank you for inviting me today. Um, uh, I would also like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people, um, which is of the land that I'm coming from today, um, which is in Canberra in the ACT. Um, look, thank you for coming here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's it's lovely to come back to CRC land. Um, I actually did my PhD as part of CRC mining um, a while ago. I won't tell you exactly how long ago. I do look younger than I am, um, uh, but it's um, it, I'm really passionate about um, the role of CRCs um, and, and and the way you bring together so many partners. Um, I'm hoping today that I can give you a bit of insight uh, into what the power of data platforms can do and enabling the data as part of the CRC. Um, and I'll show you some examples, um, you know, that I've worked on in the past, but also um, some that are emerging across the research, uh, the, mostly the research community, but in government as well. So first of all, I do come um, 
uh, from the mining uh, industry early, in my, early on in my career. I'm actually a geophysicist um, and I've used data throughout my career. Um, I've also travelled to lots of places and so it's really, um, I guess there's a bit of a quiz, maybe in the chat you can see if you can guess where these uh, abandoned mine sites are. Um, I've been to them all, they're not all in Australia, there's a hint, but I'm sure um, if you are from the sector, you'll know where some of them are. Um, look, I, I think it's amazing what CRC time um, is uh, trying to do, right? You, you want to invest, you are investing $130 million over the next 10 years on collaborative research and development projects that are going to bring um, Australian uh, innovation um, into this emerging field of clo the closure sector. Um, also, there's so much potential I see in, in these thousands and thousands of abandoned mine sites. Um, we do, you know, we sort of used to joke about it, but it's, it's really a thing now, geotourism, going out and visiting um, these sites, finding them, uh, there's citizen science on like taking photos of, uh, you know, significant geological sites and mine sites around Australia and, and submitting them in. So, um, I think there's real potential and to get the community behind um, what you're trying to do with the CRC. And then there's also the value that is actually still there in some of these sites, right? So I've worked in the gold fields in, uh, and nickel fields in, um, in Western Australia around Kalgoorlie and the amount of times I was trampsing over again, you know, the same old sites where we think that we found, you know, another offshoot, there's more gold here or there. So um, there's so much potential now. Um, to actually go back through and um, and I wanted to highlight you're probably aware but um, I attended a webinar um, a little while ago from the um, Sustainable Minerals Institute at UQ and they were talking about some really cool stuff that they were doing to get value from um, uh, the getting that value from the data from these old these old mine dumps so there's so many ideas there's so many things you can do um, I guess the challenge is, is is knowing where to start okay so if you didn't guess them I'm not really following the chat so the top one's just down the road from here, so in Canberra, so that's Captain's Flat, came out for sale a few years ago if anyone wants to buy it. Um, the bottom left is, is Kimberley in South Africa, so I did a lot of uh, research in my early in my career in, um, in Kimberley Dyke exploration. And the right hand side here, this is Charters Towers, and I did a lot of work out at Charters Towers as well. So I think um, when I did some research on your CRC and realised what you were trying to achieve, um, which is really bringing together so many across the sector, right? You've, um, and I'll talk about it on my next slide. But it did remind me um, of this, of the the tr of trust. Okay, so there is a tw there is an Edelman Trust Barometer. I I recommend you go and have a look at it. Um, and in the 2020 Edelman Trust Barometer, um, Australians they reported that Australians feel that partnering with um, uh, around um, the different not-for-profits, government and business. So if, if Australians feel that if they partner, you can actually build trust um, in the community. So um, I think it's really important, you know, we have these different sectors that often quite work quite independently in Australia and it's probably a bit more um, prolific in Australia, but actually how do we build that trust and bring them together? And you're trying to do that, right? You have um, partners uh, from government, METs, mining regions, uh, First Nations um, and researchers, and you're trying to bring them all together. And such a diverse group of stakeholders um, can be challenging. And I put it to you that um, by actually making your data available and open among all your stakeholders and potentially broader with the broader community, you can actually enable that collaboration. So data is really key to the CRC um, reaching its potential and actually achieving its goals. Um, I think it's really important because data can share, enable the different communities to share insights. Uh, you can, uh, even in, the, in this modern distributed world, we're on virtual conference now, it's harder to get together in a room together. So uh, actually having data and your data platforms in a way that people can interact with the data and learn from it um, really has massive benefits for building that community and that trust. Um, so I'm, I'm going to use COVID as my first example. So 
I think COVID data um, was shared globally in an unprecedented way. So we've never seen anything like it in the research community. Um, life science, that you think there's a challenge in the mining sector sharing data, um, life science is, is, is um, immensely worse um, and and so it's really hard not only to share you can't underestimate the being able to just share it but share it in a way that we could all interact with it so I don't know whether if then is any any of you from Melbourne so this is the COVID base AU website and I don't know whether you saw it in the news um, a little while ago this was actually built by teenagers so they didn't know, people didn't realize that teenagers got to be very popular um, app and website and, um, and Twitter channel to follow um, uh, during the Melbourne lockdowns and things. But the data is presented in such a way and it's so easy to interact with it that teenagers built a website that updates on the fly, lively, and produces the data. Have a look at it. Um, you can you can look at all the plots and all of that sort of stuff. Um, it was actually really easy. I had a one of the uh, a young woman in my team built a uh, Python notebook that that actually grabbed all of the open data as well and and presented it. Um, with plots and all sorts of fancy stuff to demonstrate the power of how you could actually access this machine readable data um, and generate your own plots really easily these days. Um, so I think that um, this is a perfect example of, of the power of data and bringing communities together. And it's quite interesting if then we go back to the topic of trust. So this is the this is again the trust barometer, um, the Edwin trust barometer, but this is looking not just at Australia, this is looking at global. And what we can see in this plot is that um, in government, which usually doesn't rate very well uh, in, in its trust rating, as we uh, were probably not surprised, but due, by May 2020, it had moved up six points globally. Um, in the trust barometer. And I, I put it to you, there's probably a few reasons, but it was the fact that um, governments around the world managed to, in their own ways, with their own communities, um, uh, meet the needs of their community um, during those first stages of COVID. Um, unfortunately, they didn't stay up there. And so by January this year, they'd lost um, most of the points that they'd gained. Um, but I think actually making data available, making um, the knowledge available meant that we didn't, you know, we could, we almost could take it, have a check on, on what the politicians were saying and what government was saying, because we could get access to the data ourselves and have a look at it. Um, the other thing that's quite interesting is that now everyone knows what a log graph is. Um, and uh, so that's another interesting thing that's come out of COVID and us making data available. Um, but it, but data sharing isn't easy, right? And and I think this is something that you are um, learning as part of uh, the CRC. Um, you have this vision in in your data integration, forecasting, and scale program to create a data platform to support the CRC um, and demonstrate the power of, of data sharing and how it can help your programs. Um, but when we when we get it right, we can empower innovation and research through data analytics and machine learning and all this sort of stuff. So this is actually a slide that I presented on at a keynote in 2017. There's a little link there. You can watch me on YouTube. It's quite embarrassing. Um, but this is from when I worked at Geoscience Australia. And this is where we were showing by spending, actually, it took us a couple of years to make all of the geophysical data um, in the data collection available in a machine-to-machine -machine readable way that was sitting at the National Computational Infrastructure, we could actually put some analytics platforms with it and you could actually interpret the data on the fly. And it actually now that data is going into implicit modeling, research and a whole lot of stuff, but it's it's taken a, it's a journey <laughs> to actually get it to that point. Um, and so, I think it's important to understand that you're not going to get things right straight away, right? Getting data right and getting the data platforms right is a journey um, and it can take years, but there are lots of people that have paved the way before you um, that you can leverage uh, leverage from to help you. Um, in, a life, in life science, they struggle, as I said before, you know, it was really amazing to see the way that COVID data was shared. 
um, and I was involved in a in a working group where we looked at um, the the different types because there's lots of data in the back end and the genomic sequencing and we see that now with the new variant coming out. Um, so they're sharing go, those those sequences and enabling everyone globally to um, map the different um, variants of COVID. But that was through a number of global data sharing working groups to agree on data standards. And it's quite, it's, it's really important that you have data standards, you abide by them, because then it makes it really easy down the track, um, because then it's really easy. People can understand your data. You don't, they don't have to call you up and go, what is this? Da, da, da. You can actually um, read it. And if you get it really right, it's machine readable. And, um, and so therefore you can ingest your web services into all sorts of platforms. Um, but in life sciences, they do struggle with data sharing. Um, and this is just a quote um, from an article um, from NIH in the States, but really reflecting um, on data sharing really being reliant, not just on the technology, but on personal resources as well, as in you've got to have the skills, you've got to have people who understand the data and know how to work with it. Um, so you can't under, you can't underestimate. Um, we've got to get we get the technology and the platforms right, but you've also got to think about the skills and the training for your community, and think about who um, who is trying to access these portals and this data so that they can use it. Um, okay, so let's get into it. So let me show you some. Um, Examples of people of, of the different portals that have happened, um, and this is quite an interesting story. This one. Um, so, as you can see, I'm showing three different portals here. Um, on the left, we've got the Geoscience Australia Exploring for the Future portal. In the mini, in the middle, we've got Minet CRC's portal, um, and on the right hand side, we've got the Oscope Discovery portal. So, this was a great collaboration that started about ten years ago, um, where Oscope collaborated with. Um, the mining industry and with the um, geological surveys to actually create a portal to make um, the data that was being collected by researchers and the geological surveys available in a standardised way. Um, uh, credit goes to colleagues at CSIRO who did a lot of work um, around this space, um, but they actually created, created the backbone or the framework for the start of us to be able to share data in this way. Um, and as you can see, you know, there's spatial data. It's all using um, Open Geospatial Consortium standards for the data so that it can be, um, uh, it is machine to machine readable. So all of those web services in the background there could actually be ingested into a different portal, right? So as a consequence, then they use the same framework to create um, more portals at Geoscience Australia. And yes, the technologies changed a little bit, the web technologies um, in the way they've generated the portals, but because they've spent that time getting the standards right with the data, they can actually replicate this for different communities. So the Minex, they really focused this portal on the National Drilling Initiative. So they're actually, um, they're making sure that data is available in that portal as they're generating it from that national data, national drilling initiative. But they've also got tons of other types of data that you can access through um, the um, toolbar on the side, but also um, you can um, search as well. So there's the ability to search. Um, but as I'm sure you're aware, with trying to search on Google, searching can only be as good as the metadata behind the data, right? So you've got to actually make sure you're describing your data in, in the right way so that people can find it and use it. Um, and then they've replicated it. Um, again, actually, I think Exploring for the Future came first. So this is the um, work that Geoscience Australia did in partnership with some of the geological surveys to actually collect more data across Northern Australia. A little bit in South Australia as well. Um, uh, uh, so, um, and this is just showing lots of the different types of data sets um, that they generated. So, this one here actually that I've got up um, is quite exciting. This is a mineral prospectivity map. So, basically, what we did is we then created some data fusion and data analytics algorithms that um, incorporated a whole of the different data sets together to generate um, different sorts of maps. Um, the only thing that I can say is these are quite static. So although you can tweak with how it looks, they're a little bit of that, um, and I'm going to say old school, my colleagues at Geoscience Australia are getting over with me, but, um, you know, you view the data and you can see it and then you download it. 
But what you can do now is there's actually a lot more that you can do with that. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. Oh, here's another example. So this is the Atlas of Living Australia. So these guys um, have been exemplars of delivering um, uh, open access data in the biodiversity community um, for a long time, got a, more than 10 years. Um, and they've gradually built on their portal. You can go in, anyone can go in and search around. So this is a cute, and, and people can submit data as well. So occurrence data of species, there's a cute little wombat that was down um, in the national park, um, down just across the border into New South Wales. I was just having a little bit of a Google this week, um, but also you can go in there and you can search and find lots of different um, types of data available. And there's lots of different types of catalog data catalogs now, and I hear you're going to be talking a bit about um, what you've been doing in the data cataloging space later. Um, but what I did want to did 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 want to show you was the potential to um, you know add that analytics, right? Like, so you, you can have the data and you can make the data available. But once you get all the data in the one place where all the community and all your stakeholders can look. Can, can get access to, then you can start sharing algorithms and insights from the data. Um, so we talk about, you know, there's really simple stuff like um, uh, sharing a piece of code, like a Python script or something, or an R script that's doing some statistics on the data. Um, EcoCloud is a great example. So um, EcoCloud has some great ambitions. It's part of um, EcoCommons. So these are Australian research um, partnering programs um, for data platforms in the research community. Um, there's a across the sector going on at the moment and really quite exciting what they're doing because what they're now trying to do is getting the data close to the compute um, and that compute could be commercial cloud or it could be research cloud um, and enabling so you don't have to think about it anymore. You go into your web browser and you can, you can just um, get that insight from the data on the fly. And this makes it a lot easier to share with um, stakeholder groups who might not have access to, well, they might have, you know, they don't have access to a supercomputer or whatever, but can they get access to a web browser? Some of these still actually work quite well on the phone. Um, we worked years ago on um, the National Geophysical Virtual Laboratory. That was a partnership between Oscope and Geoscience Australia um, and CSIRO. And that was really fantastic because we could actually, um, uh, you know, we could actually do, I could do stuff on my phone. I could look up some data. I could set a job to run um, and then come and get the result. Um, so everything is getting quite accessible. Um, now, I did think that, I did want to highlight one thing in here, which is really cool, is, is, they're, is they're creating this data explorer service, right? So they're making um, a catalogue of active, of, of available data. Now, I have focused on open data here. I come from the research community. Um, I do want to make a note that there are examples of this being done for sensitive data and commercial and confidence data as well within a community um, where there's ways that you can share in a constrained way so only people that you want to have access to data can. Um, but um, you, they're actually sharing here uh, code snippets with the data set. So they're actually not just showing you the data sets, but they're showing you how you can use it and how you can get access to it. So. For, for someone who's a bit tech savvy, like being able to deal with the code snippets good, but then what you can do is then you can um, think about those algorithms and um, compile it into some way of displaying the data in the way that you want. Here's another example. So this is an example where we're talking about the community. Um, uh, it, this is so. So, Digital Earth Australia was a partnership between um, the National Computational Infrastructure, Geoscience Australia, um, and CSIRO, and it was about making um, Earth observation data more available to the general public, to industry, um, to other government agencies in a way that they could use it. Where traditionally you had to have, you had to actually be. Um, you know, a spatial um, data expert to be able to work out how to process this data to get an insight. Um, so they came up with this concept, which was analysis ready data. So they actually generated the data pipelines um, and they've got the process involved so that then when it gets to someone going onto the um, web page and having a look at it, it's already at analysis ready stage. So what does that mean? Well, 
you're not saying, well, is, is, is what channel am I looking at of the data stream in the Landsat data or the Sentinel data? You are actually saying, well, I want to know, is there likely to be water here? So the, this is how they actually created, um, came up with the idea to begin with, was they were trying to work out how to get, um, how to map inland water surface um, observations from space. So they could understand over time from the Landsat data, um, you know, and it was, there was a specific area we were looking at, which was Menindee Lakes, um, how much did that um, recharge and how quickly did it recharge over time, how, what was a percentage over time, was it flooded or not, we can understand and then we can start predicting, um, you know, how the climate's going to change depending on um, different areas, all from the fact that they made the data analysis ready um, and so you didn't have to worry about the processing of the data, you could just get in there and start getting insights from the data. So um, that's a great, I recommend you go and have a look at that. Um, it's a fantastic um, portal and they're trying to contribute lots of data in there, but you can also ingest those data services because they're, they're presented in a standardised way into your portal as well if you wanted to. How am I going for time? Oh, okay. So um, <laughs> next steps, right? So I've shown you some great examples um, of the things and the power of what you can do with the data platform. There are so many more. I haven't really got a chance to get into lots of details. Um, but I think it's really important. The successful um, projects that I've seen have really focused on the um, outcome you're trying to achieve. So what questions are you trying to answer? Um, you know, how are you trying to get your stakeholders engaged together? Um, what are the things they all care about? Particular projects, those sorts of things. And if you can think about those questions, um, then it helps you work out, well, what do the, what's the data you have? What data you need to collect? What data are you collecting? Um, so then you can think about what can go into the portal. Thank you. And I went over time. I apologise. If you want to get in contact and find out more, um, yeah, I put my email address up there. Thanks, Karina. That, that, that was brilliant. I, I love that, you know, giving examples of where data can be used to answer challenges. So I think it's exactly what we're trying to do in the CRC. And we're trying to also find where our, our position is. There's a lot of data out there. There's a lot of things that can be done. And the question I'll throw back out to our partners down the track is, you know, what specifically does the CRC want to do that's driving towards our our overall objective around regions in transition. So I probably got time for one question. If, if there's, from my point of view, I suppose there's nothing else on the line, but from my point of view is, you're t from the CRC's point of view, they've got multiple partners across government, community, different industries, uh, industry, but different uh, mining industries, et cetera. Hmm. They've got data that we might want to access, but how you were talking about trust. How do, how do you develop that trust? How do you actually set up the the social architecture really about bringing those people together to understand there's there's value in being together than there is to actually stay apart? Oh, look, I think that's, um, I mean, that's a tricky one. I think you've got to jump in there and see the value. Like I think in that COVID example, um, they could have decided to lock down all that data and not make it available. There's plenty of examples of, of um, in the community where they've made data available and it's helped um, bring the community along. Um, I think the problem is we we don't share data because we're worried about all the risks associated with not sharing data, which are related to, um, well, someone might do something wrong with the data. They don't understand the data. Um, you know, it's my, my competitors might get in contact with the data. I think the problem is when we have that risk assessment and we, we think about it that way, we don't realise that uh, there's other risks involved. Like if we don't share the data, there's suspicion. Why aren't they sharing the data? What have they got to hide? And you actually lose trust more by not sharing the data than any potential trust you could lose by inadvertently sharing something that, you know, maybe, um, maybe was a problem. I think... Um, the life sciences community, it's its a massive challenge, personal data um, and privacy and all those sorts of things. But I think in in, in the mining space, it's the risks are lo a lot lower. Um, and so I think you should just get out there and share it. <laughs> <laughs> easy, as, easy as that. Easy as that, easy as that. Um, oh, we've got so a question. A 
I was going to say, do you want to answer a quick question and then we'll move on to the, the presentation? Uh, so the quickly. question is, are you working on knowledge-based applications and IoT? Data cleansing is one of the biggest challenges to bring them in data-readable form and can be used effectively. Are you working on these areas as well? Well, um, look, I'm very passionate about making sure we get the data pipeline right for new data we're collecting. So I was just talking to some, they're doing some great work at UTS um, in their software engineering on IoT, IoT processing data technologies where they've actually said legacy data, let's just park that, let's make sure we get the pipelines right um, for, for the future data. Um, so I'm not working on it directly right now, but we do, um, we're more, the areas that I work in more are looking at legacy data and bringing it in for geological modelling or for geophysics and those sorts of things um, and making, making that available. Um, but this is a big challenge. Um, new data, but I would put to you that it's actually easier if it's been collected now to get your pipelines right with that IoT and sensor data that you're collecting. Okay, thanks, Karina. We, we might move forward now, but really appreciate that. And if you want to, Karina is still floating around, so if you want to throw some questions in the Q&A, you're more than welcome to do that, and she can, uh, Karina will answer those questions, I hope. Um, no what we'll do now is move, move on now to um i think you hear that move on now to the presentations from the foundational projects that occurred over the last six to 12 months um these uh first there'll be a presentation by dr renee uh Des Desai. i'm sorry if i said it wrong all the time uh, renee so uh, for murdoch university on a knowledge hub or an e-library and search engine for crc time it will then be followed by a presentation by associate professor peter de Hullis from Federation University Australia on an Australian mine rehabilitation trials data and information platform. And then finally, there will be a presentation by Dr. Ibrahim Fatih Salami from Mining3 on the abandoned mine sites, on abandoned mine sites in Australia. Um, so I'll, I'll throw now to uh, Renee to get us going with the e-library. Great, thank you. And I hope everyone uh, can hear me. Um, and I wanted to say thank you very much for calling me Dr. Jason. I'm not quite a doctor yet. I'm working on my PhD, <laughs> uh, but I appreciate it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we are here today to um, talk to you about the CRC uh, e-library project. And I'm here with my two colleagues uh, who I'll introduce in a minute. Before I move on, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians across all the lands on which we live and work, and we pay our respects to elders past uh, and present. I would also like to acknowledge the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation as the traditional custodians of the country and its waters, and that Murdoch University, where we're working from today, stands on Noongar country, and we pay our respects to Noongar elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge their wisdom and advice in teaching and cultural knowledge activities. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, the team from Murdoch University, myself, uh, my colleague, Dr. Mark Seifer, who is on the screen with you, our colleague, Dr. Lauren Omani, who is sitting right behind us uh, and is in the room with us today, and our very good colleague, Brad Power, who is the literally the powerhouse behind the technology development of the search engine. Um, so I just, I'm gonna give a bit of a context to the work that we've done, and I'm going to pass over to Mark, who then will take you through the design process and also give you a little sneak peek of the search engine. Um, before I do that, I just realized I'd like to also thank a couple of people who've been quite integral in the um, development process, the engagement process, uh, and also coming up to the launch of the, the search engine. And that is uh, Jane and Nicole from the CRC. We'd like to thank them uh, very much for helping us and, and connecting us with people, specifically uh, the team from Clever Starfish who managed the CRC website, uh, and also the team from Turnkey who are responsible for the Connect portal. Um, so we, when we started this project, we were looking primarily at an, an e-library, a way to bring together content from across the CRC and eventually um, within the community outside of the CRC uh, in relation to my enclosure. Once we got into the process, we realized fairly quickly that what we were looking at was research, uh, research translation um, and knowledge translation. 
uh, and the role of digital communication in that process. Um, so we're looking at knowledge translation as stated by Knowledge Translation Australia, which is um, getting the right information to the right people at the right time and in a format that they can use uh, so as to influence decision making. So that's really what we've been um, uh, contextually thinking about and uh, critically analysing within the, the research process of this project. Um, and so what we intend this to do is allow us, uh, allow the CRC a way to translate the myriad knowledge that is being created, uh, developed and produced in, uh, within the CRC context. So it's important for growing um, ways, but from our, our perspective in the arts and humanities, we're looking to translate knowledge from sciences. So this is really a way to connect science, life sciences, um, social sciences with arts and humanities. Uh, and there's a various um, important reasons why we're doing that. So the premise of this project um, is necessarily because of the rise of, of uh, the internet and internet usage and particularly the rise of Google um, as the dominant influencer in search engine wars. So we went from this idea of knowledge, a knowledge base and uh, an e-library to a search engine um, with an interface that allows people to find information that they, they're looking for quickly and use it quickly and, and then in order to enable knowledge translation. So the project that we're doing falls into this category um, necessarily because the searchable corpus needs to be curated by domain experts um, and the search interface needs to be customised for potential consumers of the information and the content and that's what we've been following as a, as a, a research context. So it contributes to the body of studies that examine non-mainstream domain specific search engines uh, and through user studies, surveys, interviews and feedback it's sort of evolved uh, a search engine to suit the needs of the CRC specifically and its wider stakeholders and audiences. Um, so what we've done, um, we, we're here to, to support and to provide um, a, a platform for the CRC to deliver a resilient post mine future. That's what um, we're, we're hoping to do. Um, and the idea is that our project provides that platform to connect all the people behind the projects empower communities to make long-term impacts on sustainable closure of mine sites. And we're enabling this knowledge translation process through community stakeholder and community engagement, uh, through creative media, through user-driven uh, and evidence-based design, and through software development. So we're bringing together those three very important elements of humanities to enable that knowledge translation in, in science and social sciences. So the end product, which we'll show you uh, very soon, uh, is a custom software interface for the CRC's chosen database, a project management system, which is called Turnkey, and we know it as Connect, uh, which will serve as the library platform itself and host the, the documentation through this evidence-based best practice model that we've developed. Um, it acts like the search engine, similar to Google, searches the database and the wider web, and um, we're moving towards other online databases. We're going to add publicly available documents, which we already have done uh, in a test phase, including web links, photos, audio, video files, but mostly we're looking at, at, at documents at this stage, following a, a set governance and provenance process. And the intention is to then grow the e-library to become the preeminent source of information for my inclusion in Australia and eventually internationally. And uh, the search engine is the public face of the CRC's knowledge base. So I'd like to pass over to my colleague, uh, Mark, now, who will take you through the design process. All right, very good. Thanks, Renee. So, um, so the design, so I'm going to talk about the design process and the different kind of iterations and problems and solutions that we eventually came up with. So, um, so in terms of the design process, we predominantly use an evidence-based design methodology. Um, and this helped us come up with the initial design concepts and helped us to refine the prototypes for Z. Um, as the name suggests, evidence-based design um, is about gathering data from users, essentially, and external sources from external sources and trying to um, use that data to inform the different kinds of design solutions um, that we come up with. 
So, I mean, the obvious benefits of evidence-based design is that it gives us substantial design um, data that backs up our design choices. Um, it gives credibility to um, our visual communication strategies that we eventually came up with, and hopefully leads to a thoroughly tested, and hopefully a successful outcome. So evidence-based design um, works hand in hand with what's called user-centered design and UX or user experience design. They're basically the same thing. Um, and the point is, is that um, in each stage of the user-centered design process, data is kind of worked back into um, the idea and uh, the concept and hopefully it helps to improve um, the design. So in the diagram, for example, um, from when we jump from the research to the concept stage, um, if there's a problem with the concept um, and we find that problem by user testing. So if there's an issue, then it means we need to go back to our research and have a have reinterpret our research and have a look at our research or gather wider forms of, of data um, to help us inform the concept. And so that kind of works throughout the whole thing, right? So um, in the end, we get uh, hopefully something that's thoroughly tested and um, we launch something that is useful for users since they've had a kind of say in everything to do with the process so far. So the design process, we kind of broke down into three different phases, the pre-design, the design and prototype stage. So in the initial pre-design stage, um, we're essentially just trying to um, match the data that we had gathered from kind of very, very specific quantitative data. Um, and we're trying to match that with what are called UX patterns. Um, and UX patterns are um, kind of generic ways that users will react to, um, to different kind of visual stimulus. And so we were trying to use, um, trying to connect the data that we'd gathered with those UX patterns. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but that's okay. Um, that's what this whole process is about, is about trying to test on users. So for example, I don't know if you can see, but on the left-hand side of those two concept designs there, um, there's a little kind of hierarchical infographic, which I thought was a great idea. <laughs> but um, but after user testing it for a while, um, and it also it also didn't fit the um, it also didn't fit the kind of data that we were going to get from Connect and Salesforce. So um, so in essence, it didn't work because the the user didn't understand the context for it um, and. Um, although I had a great idea as a designer, um, at least I was able to test that with users. And, um, and then we found the problem at the beginning as opposed to the very end, which is, which is another good thing about the whole process. So, um, so anyway, so here we're just testing very basic ideas about um, whether or not um, certain elements are going to push forward or push back. And we're testing what's called scannability and, um, and information architecture to ensure that users understood um, how to use what it is that they're looking at. So this is a pre-design stage, very basic, um, you know, very basic designs, not very pretty. So then we moved into a kind of design phase where we gathered a more, where we did a more formal survey of a wider sample of CRC stakeholders. And this enabled us to refine our initial designs based on um, some functional requirements and also um, some very kind of soft things. Um, so we're on, on the user skill sets, where we, how old they were, uh, their use of technology, um, those kinds of things help to drive um, the kind of design choices that we made. And that data was reflected in the, in the formal survey um, that we made. So the first design there um, on the left hand side, we're just playing with different kinds of backgrounds. Um, what we're trying to do always um, in interface design is to give emphasis to the content. Um, and so we're playing with different backgrounds, one to make it interesting so it's not so cold and so um, kind of Google-like, which is all about the content and not, nothing else. Whereas this, this, um, this project was a little bit different, right? We were trying to kind of engage users um, with different textures and textures are about touchy feely things. Anyway, I won't go too deep. Um, and, and the last two slides are on the second and the third on the left and in the middle and on the right. 
they were, they were more about um, testing different types of information architecture. Information architecture is about the layout of the content. And so we were testing out um, what's called a horizontal card view and a vertical card view um, with different backgrounds, different colors, um, different icons. We're trying to test and push and pull different ideas around and then asking users um, what they thought and then trying to integrate that feedback back into um, the final design. We're getting there. Um, okay, so just this is a final, this was one of the prototypes that we used, or one of several prototypes that we made. Um, so we did a quantitative survey and a, and a usability test. Um, a usability test was where I had users sit down with me um, and we did what was called a think of our protocol test. And that enabled us to, to get a hand, like a face-to-face -face understanding of how users were going to um, use the interface. So essentially, basically, the idea was that uh, we had two different concepts. Um, we tested them. It was called simple A-B testing. Um, and, uh, and concept one was the winner. So that on the left-hand side was the winner. Concept two, um, that we took some elements that users wanted. Um, so, uh, so we integrated those in the end. And in the end, this is the final thing. So we integrated a whole range of different elements from concept two into the final into the final design. Um, everyone loved the background image, so we kept that. Um, we pushed the, we played around with the, the contrast and the size of different elements. And um, and also there was an advanced search engine section as well, which is the middle slide. And we changed um, a lot of, we changed a little bit of the, the kind of positioning. It's, anyway, it's very anal. When you're a graphic designer, all those little tiny things make all the difference, trust me. Um, and then the final one, we have the, um, the vertical, sorry, the horizontal card view one out um, from user testing in terms of how easy it was to use. Um, and so, yeah, that's the final product. Let's show, show the final thing. Okay, so the final thing, um, which, which essentially runs from a browser, um, is, is almost exactly as, um, as we designed it. So, and um, you can, type something in and you get predictive, um, which is uh, kind of best practice in terms of um, search engine. When we were doing the literature review, we found a whole range of um, best practices. And so when we're looking for, um, to be able to do predictive search is kind of really important anyway. So when we do the search and and then we have our um, horizontal card view, there's a couple of things that are different about it. One, we don't get the images um, and that's simply as a result of the the nature of the, the database and um, whether or not there are images actually in the articles that are submitted. So, um, but yeah. Click on one. Click on one, yeah, sure. Um, that's a good idea. I should show you where it goes. And so the end, end you end up with the, the article itself. Um, yeah, so that's it. That's it. Thank you very much. If thanks there's any questions, um, now I'll see Mr. Renee, feel free to ask directly. So thanks very much, Renee. And um, so I'm Pete Delhouse. I'm from Federation University. The project I was involved in is called Mine Rehabilitation Trials Online or the MRTO project. This work was done by myself and Pat Bonney, uh, who's a postdoc from Fed Uni, and David Lemon from CSIRO. So effectively, this project really was about developing that framework that is that sort of framework that Karina spoke about uh, at the start, where we've got this sort of ability to create an interoperable knowledge system or, you know, plat and that in itself leads to platforms for sharing data, information and knowledge. This was specifically around mine closure planning and practices. And so the, we envisaged that the data would typically include just mine rehab uh, trials and um, information and data, because we felt that that was probably uh, of great importance to the mining industry and also possibly something that they would like to share. So the partners in this project were um, those listed on the screen uh, and in the research really, you know, involved a, a team at Federation Uni and RO 
we collaborate a lot and we have expertise in this whole idea of data federation. And what I mean by that is that we take data from disparate sources, preferably on the fly if we can, from both private and public sectors and try and make that findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, known as FAIR, the FAIR data guidelines, and, and then sort of work on data stewardship and governance models of how you would actually go about doing that. The four components, really, there was a social science component, which Patrick uh, undertook, and that was to consult with the end users to look at what use cases, you know, what would make the value proposition for them? Why, why would you want to share your data? That, that's the question, you know, so, so that's an important part because otherwise it won't work. The second part was to test the technical architecture. And so we we're hoping to pilot two areas, the Pilbara and the Latrobe Valley, to look at, you know, testing the architecture to, to find these potential barriers and, and benefits and so on. The third one was then to look at the architectural framework, particularly the social architecture and the information architecture and the technical elements that are, are required to get this working for the CRC time, if that was the case. And that, all this ended up in a project report. So if, if we look at the social science summary, the benefits of those, as Karina said, you know, they're things like improved transparency, uh, you know, knowledge discovery, sector-wide learning. If, if something works in one place, will it work in another? Maybe you could share that information or that knowledge. Efficiency and cost savings, obviously, because if someone's done it before and you can learn about that, then that's going to save money. And stakeholder relationships, it builds those relationships in, in there. The barriers are the typical barriers we see in this work in classically in, in the other stuff we do as well. So there are technical barriers, you know, does the data exist? Is it in, in a, a, a good form? You know, is there metadata? Obviously, there, often there's not. Uh, there are motivational barriers, you know, like people worry about uh, manipulation of the data or criticism or misuse of the data. There's economic barriers that, you know, might cause some damage to the, to the business or, um, you know, they're worried about the time it takes or something. Political barriers around lack of trust, you know, I'm happy to share my data, but they're not sharing back or happy for the researchers to see it, don't want the banks to see it, that sort of, uh, or the competitors to see it, you know. Uh, legal uh, impediments, you know, who owns the data, the IP, those sorts of things, and then, which is this lack of uh, reciprocity. But what we found essentially was that, you know, sharing mine rehab data is, is Look, it's immature in the industry at the moment, but it's it's an evolving practice. There are other uh, industries where it's working a lot better. In terms of the value propositions, these these really fell out into four cases. You know, the the and this came out of the social research that from what people said. So effectively, you know, this idea that you foster industry development. That's a really good thing. You you get to know what other people are doing, and it you know creates the kind of a uh, a camaraderie around the industry. The knowledge discovery and reuse, that's really important. The, the you know, ability to be able to look at what worked, what was a success or what was a good outcome or a bad outcome elsewhere and to share that. And also just to enhance trust and transparency and efficiency, particularly with the public. You know, this, this idea of being able to to make data available that you want to make available. I mean, all this happens at, at you know, it's your data, you set the rules, but, but being able to have the ability to show others how that works. So we constructed a demonstrator. The demonstrator, this is the Pilbara area that we were demonstrating. And we just stacked it full of publicly available data in the hope that, you know, people might look at this and get the idea of what they could do with sharing their own data. You can, have, there's the web address up the top. It's just a beach site at the moment, whether it'll survive or not, we're not sure at the moment uh, in this, but this was the, the site that was created. It's just a web mapping portal. It's interactive. It brings data in on the fly. It brings data in, in in OGC standard formats where it's available and so on. Uh, 
you know, through the project, despite our best efforts, in the end, there was no private sector data that was included um, by the participants. There were reasons for that. Those barrier reasons that just that I spoke about were mostly those ones. You know, people were concerned about sharing data. Um, you know, in the Latrobe Valley, this is the Latrobe Valley, for example, and these dots on the screen are the current status of uh, mine sites, you know, abandoned, closed, current, you know, unknown, etc. So sharing government data was okay. Sharing mine data, there was a concern about the regulators. There was a concern at the regulators. There was a concern about things like, um, you know, whether the get it past the bureaucracy within the, within the system. The, the last part of this was the social architecture, you know, and the social architecture was worked out by Dave Lemon at CSIRO. And it's really, you know, why would you bother? You know, what, what are the issues around this? I mean, all those things about what people could do or don't do with your data, you know, how would you do this? What's the what's the IP, the legislation, all that sort of stuff, typical questions. And, and in this, we borrowed heavily from uh, other examples. So we've done one with called the Agricultural Research Federation. It's an NCRIS funded project uh, at the national level, same as Ozscope or um, Atlas of Living Australia or TURN or any of those. The difference with these projects that we look at is that we don't take the data, you know. The data stays with the custodian, but it gets shared according to the rules that the custodian set. Visualise your soils, a big project through the soil CRC, 21 farmer groups sharing data, you know, in, in this project and in uh, CSIRO running the climate service. And, and out of these, we looked at the governance structures and everything else and made recommendations for the CRC time, which are essentially the recommendations uh, shown here on the screen, you know. Uh, and so that's really the, the, the balls now in the court of the CRC time. And, and that includes their partners, of course, their members, as to whether or not this really will uh, be developed, whether the value proposition is good enough, whether the the structure that we've created suits what people think. It's it can't happen unless it's got the endorsement of unless people want it to happen. Really, that's what it boils down to. So that's uh, this project was was really good, and uh, we enjoyed it immensely. Uh, shame it didn't quite work out as we hoped. Um, if you want more information, thanks. Uh, for your time, there's my email address, and thanks, thanks very much. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yep. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ibrahim uh, Fatih Salmi, and I'm presenting today on behalf of the research team that you can see here, and also on. Uh, I have shared. Oh, yeah, yeah. I apologize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I'm the project leader for uh, the CRC time project on abandoned mines. So I'm presenting on the beh on behalf of the research team that you can see here. I would like to acknowledge uh, the country. And I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodian across all the lands on which we live and work. And I pay my respect to elders, both past and present. I especially would like to acknowledge um, uh, Turbal and Jagara people, the traditional custodian of the land on which QCAT, Queensland Center of Advanced Technology, is located. And I'm presenting today. So, why abandoned mines are important? I have included a few examples of abandonment issues from Australia. You can see they can damage the environment or they can cause significant damages to uh, people uh, uh, and uh, structure and infrastructure, and they can cause significant risk to, to uh, human. And also you can see a few examples from abandoned mines in New Zealand and the associated problem. So we started this project and uh, we realized that abandoned mines is gonna be a complex project. It has a lot of 
uh, complexity. So to narrow down the scope, we started with uh, a surveying that we did through CRC, uh, CRC time network. Uh, and then we interviewed uh, government people, those that are involved in the um, uh, rehabilitation and the management of abandoned mine. And then uh, we perform uh, a, a deep literature study to identify the risk and uh, opportunities associated with abandoned mine. And then I'll provide you with some recommendation for next stage, uh, stages of the work in this area. So uh, the survey that we performed, it came up with lots of interesting uh, outcome. For example, uh, we realized that people are interested in at least three different aspects of abandoned mine. One is uh, if we can reuse these uh, abandoned mines for mining purposes or for testing new mining methods, uh, or for, for instance, extracting value metals or rare elements from the waste and the tailings of abandoned mine. The other one was to see if we can harmonize these uh, approaches that we have for building uh, for for the assessment of risk and for the prioritization um, of abandoned mines for rehabilitation, and also to see if we can build a national database of abandoned mines specifically for rehabilitation. And the third option was to see if we can reuse, repurpose, or co-purpose these abandoned mines for uh, innovative approaches. And then we uh, had a lot of uh, uh, meetings and interview or we interviewed different government agents from different states and territories and uh, in terms of building the national inventory of uh, abandoned mine we realized that each state and territory they have their own uh, they have built or are building their own inventories or databases and um, at, although this this uh, the quality of the data are not similar and uh, in some cases they are not that good and also uh, the demand of data and the type of data that are stored in these inventories are not similar. We realized that building this inventory of abandoned mine at this, this stage is not the priority for, for the government agent. Uh, uh, and it's because each state uh, or territory governments, they are just dealing with their own uh, abandoned mines with their specific uh, characteristics. In terms of prioritization, uh, harmonizing the prioritization and risk assessment approaches, we also uh, realized that there are a few relatively mature and uh, well-developed uh, approaches for rehabilitation or for harmonizing, sorry, for the prioritization of the size for uh, uh, rehabilitation. And some states, they, they have also uh, borrowed and amended the, the approaches from other states. But uh, in terms of reusing or repurposing, we realize that government people, they are quite interested in this area, uh, especially those that uh, they have abandoned mine close to communities. And uh, we also realize from the communication that unfortunately the rules and regulations are not similar in different states and territories. Uh, uh, if you would like to reuse or repurpose these abandoned mines. Uh, and also the majority of the government agents that we interviewed, they were interested uh, in building a national abandoned mine group to be able to bring together government people, regulator, uh, investor, uh, different stake stakeholders and uh, university people to be able to address this abandoned mine problem in Australia. And uh, also, in terms of reusing and repurposing, we, we have had quite a lot of uh, presentation in this area, especially Professor Andrew Beard yesterday presented in this topic. And we realized that we have to change the, the, uh, our point of view regarding considering this abandoned mine as a risk. We have to relook at them as a priority and the, uh, as, a, as an asset and prioritize them for uh, uh, repurposing and reusing. But what are important to be able to repurpose or reuse these abandoned mines is that we have to change our conventional um, approach regarding pumping monies to these abandoned mines to be able to close them uh, and uh, generate uh, a sterilized land. But the truth is that we may not need a sterilized land. 
and that's not the optimum case to be able to deal with abandoned mine. If we borrow the concept of uh, circular economy, there might be lots of uh, opportunities to be able to uh, repurpose, co-purpose, or reuse the abandoned mine. Like, for instance, this example that I showed you, building a uh, huge uh, uh, hotel in an old abandoned quarry or using these abandoned mines for, for instance, for uh, building uh, uh, hydroelectric facilities or data centers, like what we see in, a, in an abandoned mine in Norway. But the important thing is that we have to have access, data, uh, access to data. And Dr. Karina uh, Kemp, uh, she well explained this part. So data availability is an important aspect if we want to use to, to, to uh, find the best use case for any abandoned mine. And we have something about 60,000 to 80,000 of these abandoned mine feature in Australia. So uh, unfortunately, the problem with uh, abandoned or inactive mine is that we often don't have access to good uh, uh, quality data rela related to these mines. However, closing mines, they have often access to lots of good quality data related to geomechanic, hydrogeology, geochemistry, uh, and uh, social, even, even lots of uh, social data that are needed for repurposing and re co-purposing the abandoned mines. And then we need uh, access to uh, platforms like machine learning approaches, uh, or uh, artificial intelligence to be able to fuse the data, integrate them, and uh, find the best use cases for abandoned mines. And that's my presentation today. If you are interested in this project, please uh, contact me. And if you are any question, I'm more than happy to answer the question. Hi. Um... I think I'm live now. So apologies for going slightly over with our time, but I would like to say thanks once again to all the presenters or thank all the presenters in the session. Um, and I just want to say to, to you guys as end users, happy to have a conversation at any point in time around data science and data analytics, how we can actually address our challenges in the CRC moving forward. And I hope you have the time now to move into the workshops, which is some of the innovation areas that we want to drive forward. So I'll stop there and hopefully see you guys soon.